Everyone says they're going to be brief at the end, and I'm not going to make any commitment to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> let, let me talk about this paper. I, I find this paper kind of intriguing, and I, I confess uh, I'm not sure I fully understand it. So my discussion is going to be a little bit reflecting what I understood the paper to have done, and then some calculations that I did to try and dig a little bit deeper. And I may have fallen down a rabbit hole, but let's see. Uh, but it's obviously, you know, it's on a very topical issue. Jim's Bullard's uh, after dinner remarks, of course, make clear that policymakers have uh, still a lot of interest in trying to understand dynamics that are generated by the possibility of liquidity trap. And so at least Jim's kind of confronted members of this audience with a challenge to try to better understand what at least learning models might be able to say about that. And so this paper is very much in that spirit, and so therefore very welcome. So. The task is to think about designing monetary policy when the zero lower bounds are constrained, right? And so, I've, here's a model, which is just a first order approximation, more or less, so I'll give some caveats later, to what Kaushik and Serpo are working with. So this is just aggregate demand, it's a permanent income guy, essentially, right? Output's gonna depend on projections of future wages or output, they're equivalent in this model. So it's going to depend on variations in real interest rates, which you discount this, these future wages at. Price setters, they're going to care about future marginal costs. They also care about future goods price setters, just through strategic complementarity. Okay? So the difficult thing in these models is people have a complicated forecasting problem. right? They have to project all these things into the infinite future, and the question is how they do that. Uh, and so this paper is kind of... Uh, centrally concerned with the complexity of this forecasting model and asking whether communication pro policy can make this forecasting problem somewhat simpler, right? So we're going to make some simple assumptions in this paper just because it's complicated, which is that to make projections about these macroeconomic objects, we're just going to learn about the means of them. I mean, they have no uncertainty, so it's just uh, point expectations, right? But more generally, you can think about using any kind of reduced form statistical model and we want to ask, well, can communication make uh, those forecasts more efficient in some sense? So can we provide information that makes these forecasts in some sense more accurate? So the way to think about this is take any policy rule. This is just a log linear Taylor rule that responds to inflation and deviations from some target and output or the output gap, uh, or output from some target or the output gap, right? So the idea is that from this specification, individuals can think about just using any kind of statistical model to forecast interest rates, but the question is, well, what if they know something about how those interest rates are actually determined, right? So if agents actually understood that this was the policy strategy of the central bank, you no longer have to independently forecast interest rates, right? You could forecast future inflation, future output, and back out a forecast of future interest rates that is consistent with this policy strategy. And so this is going to be the notion of communication exploited in this paper, right? Why that's important is because, in general, what you can show is that absent knowledge of this rule, it's quite possible that beliefs, you know, arbitrary beliefs about future normal interest rates and inflation, for example, need not be consistent with the Taylor principle, right? So you may be projecting very flat uh, real interest rates in situations where inflation is rising rapidly when you don't know what the central bank's doing. So knowledge of the rule allows you to kind of generate policy consistent forecasts. What does the instrument rule looked at here? It's a variant of the Taylor rule, and this is the one I'll focus on, which instead responds to some measure of a price gap, where this price gap is just the you know, equilibrium price level relevant relative to some target price called PT bar. Okay, so I'll come back to this guy. But the principle is the same. Knowing something about the rule allows you just to project this price gap, xt, the output gap, uh, and then back out a uh, uh, strategy consistent forecast. Okay, so that's one dimension of announcement in this policy in this framework, which they call transparency. So knowledge of the rule is one aspect of communication with the central bank. The second one, which is kind of the prime principle focus, really the, the whole paper presumes people know what the rules are. For policy, the focus of the paper is really to think about well, what additional information might be conveyed, and the specific piece of information is something about the targeted price path that the central bank is interested in implementing, right? And so this is kind of some notion of forward guidance. How does that work? Well, there's a mapping between the desired target rate of inflation, which determines this price path that the central bank wants to implement, 
obviously the prevailing inflation rate, and then how the evolution of these price gaps evolve. And so the idea now is to say, well, if I know what PT, what pi star is, right, and the previous uh, gap, I can work out, well, a consistent forecast for the gap that's consistent with the desired inflation outcomes, or well, the way they turn it around is, in fact, to say, given about what the price gap are into the future, what must be the model consistent forecast, I mean, the consistent forecast for my views about inflation, okay? And so one question I have a little bit is, I'm a little, I mean, this price gap is not, you know, it's not, I mean, it is an equilibrium outcome, but it's something that the central bank kind of constructs and plugs into its rule. And I don't quite understand how a central bank would talk about its policy rule independently of the desired targeted rate of inflation, right? So to compute X T, this price gap, you need to know what the target of price level is, uh, as well as the equilibrium price level, right, to compute that difference, that's the price gap. And in some sense, I mean, is it the central bank that's going to be giving this information so people can use it in constructing uh, their forecasts, or is it, uh, you know, some other idea? So I don't quite know how to think about it. Uh, but the basic idea is you want to have consistent forecast between inflation and this price gap. So that's the notion of forward guidance. So that's the idea of communication in the paper. The paper then does a lot of stuff, right? You can see Kalshik was rushing through it. They look at the demona of attraction of these policies, impulse responses, volatility, frequency of counting, zero lower bound, and also the consequences of the inflation target. So it's pretty an exhaustive analysis of the environment. The kind of conclusions are that in general, inflation targeting is superior, or at least when there's absent uh, forward guidance. And in the case that there is forward guidance, PLT does better. And what I'd like to see in the paper is kind of a bit more of a detailed discussion about what's going on here in terms of the basic mechanics. I mean, a lot of what we know from e-stability analysis and elsewhere is that rules that respond to the price level, that price level, are really conducive to stability. And so I'm a little bit puzzled about why it does so much better, and so it'd be nice to understand that in some greater detail. Also, how couching or locating your paper relative to John Williams' work, I think, would be valuable because he does many of these things uh, also in a slightly different context. So, I have a few reflections on the paper. And uh, part of one of the most puzzling things, and you mentioned there was intuition in the paper about the impulse response functions, I, I, I didn't see it. And maybe I didn't read the paper carefully enough, but I looked at the impulse response functions and I found them quite puzzling. So, I tried to understand a little bit about what was driving them, that led me to the theorems on the learnability of the two different steady states, and that then led me to thinking about how the anticipated utility approach was actually implemented in this paper. So I'll show you some calculations. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about other things I think you could do, but there's already a lot in the paper. So there are two key assumptions in this paper in thinking about Rottenberg pricing. Um, one is that firms understand this symmetric equilibrium is going to hold in all future periods. So they understand that the price that they set is going to be equal to the aggregate price level, right? And so this is a rational expectation for logic, and we could argue about whether it's reasonable or not. And I mean, on, on some level, I think it's it's fine. Okay, maybe people learn this, but then I have to think a little bit about what the economics of that is. But it actually has important implications. But conditional on that assumption, then the way that infinite horizon expectations come in the Phillips curve is really just from iterating an Euler equation, right? And what I'm going to show you is that's not the anticipated utility solution. And I think that's fine, except that the object that they derive actually has some unusual implications relative to standard of the, the micro foundations of the model, right? So one is that inflation doesn't depend on inflation expectations in price setting. And uh, and the other is that the flexible price equilibrium, which is where all the theoretical results are generated under the special case of flexible prices, actually doesn't nest the underlying model. And in, in particular, output's not exogenously determined, which should be the case in the flexible price equilibrium. So this is Rottenberg. I mean, they, they have a yield and farming model, but this is the same thing. Uh, the only diff, I got QT, that's a stochastic discount factor, but that should be just beta to the power of T, cap T minus T, right? So you all know this problem. You want to minimize this, these are the quadratic costs of adjustment. We get an ugly first order condition, right? So I don't want to work with that because it's too hard for me. So I take a log linear approximation just to make these points here, right? This is the log linear approximation just says, you know, my, my own price inflation is going to depend on my beliefs about my own future price inflation. And then some exogenous stuff, marginal cost today, 
the aggregate price level relative to my own price, right? So this is a second order difference equation in my own price. So the way we solve this normally is to factor out the two roots. We solve the explosive root forward, and that's the solution. That's what Rodenberg taught us. What are we doing in this paper? Firms are assumed to know that in future periods, not today, but in future periods, prices are going to, their own price is going to be set equal to the aggregate price level. That's true for everyone. That allows us to derive the following object. So now we have my own price inflation depends on my views about aggregate price inflation, and it depends on this uh, marginal cost. And I've defined this new parameter, which is a function of steady state output, the degree of uh, strategic, I mean, monopolistic competition between differentiated goods in the underlying economy, and gamma, which is the cost of the price adjustment. So no cost, gamma is equal to zero, this guy is equal to infinity, right? Then we aggregate this, everyone's the same, we just get the aggregate price level, we write this, we've got inflation, it depends on expected inflation marginal cost. So this is the standard Euler equation that comes out of rational expectations logic. So this assumption of symmetry and understanding of it has some consequences for the underlying structure. So that's the first assumption, fine. The second assumption is let's just solve this forward in time to kind of make long horizon expectations relevant to uh, price setting today, right? And so the paper says it's transversality that pins this down. It's really just an assumption that comes from rational expectations logic that we want to look at bounded rational expectations equilibrium that allow us to generate this thing. So they call this the infinite horizon representation. Again, I think that's fine. I don't have too big of problems with it. It's not the anticipated utility solution to the first order. It would be this guy, right? We could rearrange this and make it inflation depends on projections of the future history of marginal costs and the future history of, uh, of the aggregate inflation, right? So the, as I said, the first important point is inflation expectations don't matter there. Do we care? I don't know. I suspect we do in thinking about the zero lower bound, right? Because a large part, I mean, we had Mordecai telling us about a fundamental mechanism that operates through inflation expectations. Clearly, that strategic complementarity matters for current price setting, and it's a key part of the channel in thinking about why we want to shift expectations at the zero lower bound. And so I think one of the basic mechanics of the Keynesian model gets lost by these calculations. The second thing that puzzled me, mainly because it pops out directly in your face in the theoretical proofs for stability of this liquidity trap equilibrium, or the instability of it, is the following property. If I look at the flexible price equilibrium, right, so I take this transaction's cost of zero, that's equivalent to this going to infinity, just take it over the other side, so this guy goes to zero, what am I left with? I'm just left with this present discounted sum of expected or current and expected marginal costs have to be equal to zero. Take out the first element, I get this relationship. Under rational expectations, in, in the, given the assumptions, there are no shocks, there's nothing else going on, the marginal costs are just, this thing's going to drop out and be equal to zero, right? Under learning, this is a predetermined object, and so it's kind of an interesting beast, but it's certainly not the case that the output, which is proportional marginal, which is the same as marginal costs and uh, the model assumptions is equal to zero. So, and you evaluate this, and then I'm kind of wondering whether some of this cyclical stuff and these impulse response functions has been driven by this. So once we use this point expectations or some of my beliefs are always the same, I evaluate the infinite sum, it's now being multiplied by this elasticity beta of one minus beta, which could be huge. I mean, you know, for a quarterly model, we would think that's 100, okay? So in this flexible price equilibrium, you've got this thing moving around immensely with a negative root, and I kind of wonder whether that's driving some of the dynamics. Um, and as I said, you know, maybe we don't want to insist that it uh, respects the micro foundations exactly, but th this would be zero under standard assumptions, uh, and also the anticipated utility solution. Does it matter? I don't know. I mean, the, it's unclear from the paper, and it's been used in quite a few different frameworks, and, and it may not matter, but it'd be interesting to see whether this is driving some of the dynamic. How's my time? You got about three minutes. So paper does a lot, so it's probably unfair to ask them to do something else. I, I guess I put this in just because Jim was saying, you know, I never worked on this explicitly, I mean, myself, but Jim was saying, well, you guys haven't thought hard enough about what's going on, the zero lower bound, and thinking about models with non-rational expectations. I mean, 
I think there are things we could do in the current, using the framework that Kaushik and, and Seppo developed to think about that. And so Stefano, I mean, one way to present some of the information might be to use uh, kind of some phase diagrams that uh, Stefano uses in a very closely related paper, which I'm not sure is cited in, in, uh, in the article. Um, this is really a non-linear model as well, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. It's where one period ahead forecasts matter, but importantly, agents have to make projections about the interest rate in one period advance, so there's some uncertainty about interest rate policy. And so he does a similar analysis. He's trying to get a handle on what the domain of attraction is in regimes where the policy is communicated, where it's not communicated. So this is just a plot, right? There's the Intended steady state, there's the un unintended steady state, there's this object called the corridor of stability. So any points within this corridor are going to converge to the steady state eventually. Anything outside of it goes somewhere else, right? And this guy is not learnable, so it's an unstable uh, equilibrium. And so what he discusses at length is like, depending on the nature of an aggregate demand shock, we may have very different profiles for expectations about inflation and output. So if we have a small one, we get back there quickly. If we're at point B, it's possible we could you know, have very long periods of stagnation in a sense where output's low, inflation's low, and expectations are low. And I think what would be interesting is for some of these research, you know, Seppo and, and uh, Kaushik to use the kind of knowledge they've gained to maybe tell us a little bit more about the nature of those transition paths. To close, if you communicate the policy, uh, this domain of attraction expands immensely. So these are the still the same three size shocks, but what you can see now is in fact the dynamics uh, are much more conducive to stability. It still may be the case that for large shocks we're kind of influenced heavily by this lower in unintended steady state, even though it's not learnable. And I, I think that's one response to kind of Jim's remarks. Well, fine, it's not learnable but it still has important uh, implications for the shape of these dynamics. So I think maybe giving some quantification to what these trajectories look like uh, would also be useful either in this paper or future research. So anyway, thank you. Interesting paper. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but I'm looking forward to seeing uh, future iterations. So, and thanks again to everyone. I appreciate it.